taught that Stalin is just an appalling monster. This is utter nonsense. The economy grew massively under Stalin, quicker than any society ever industrialized. And people's lives got a whole lot better. He killed millions of people. Capitalism generates poverty because it concentrates wealth in a few hands. What's more important, living out my purpose and ambitions or living a safe and guaranteed life? Should you not be allowed to live out your purpose? Of course you should. But should somebody starve so that you can do that? I would say capitalism kills 14 million people each and every year. Come on. I don't think that's how the world works. Do you? I do. Yes, I do. My guest today is Dr. Asatar Baer, who's an associate professor at economics uh, uh, of economics at Riverside City College. He's a self-identified communist. Dr. Baer frequently praises dictators like Stalin and Mao. Dr. Baer speaks and writes about meditation, has written over 150 blog posts about heart-centered spiritual development. He has practiced meditation since he was a small child, and he holds a PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Doc, appreciate you for being a guest on Value Tainment. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I got to tell you, I was on Twitter. I was looking at Twitter. Moments after I post a very positive capitalistic tweet, then I see your tweet come out. I got to read it to everybody because this, this kind of uh, lets the audience know, you know, how similar a belief system you and I have, and they're going to be able to enjoy it at the end of the day. Here we go. <laughs> your tweet that just came out. Let me see this here. Speaking of debates, I'm being interviewed by Patrick Bay David in a few. Should be interesting. Ha ha. Hashtag communism will win. <laughs> I like your spirit of competition, which is a capitalistic quality. I admire that a lot. Anyways, okay. So, Doc, we got some time together. If you don't mind, would you mind taking a moment and kind of uh, uh, sharing with the audience your background, upbringing? you know, school and how you came about your philosophy so the audience can get a better understanding of your background? Sure. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a spiritual community. My parents uh, very interested in, in meditation, philosophy, and became uh, students of Sufism. Uh, and this is Western Sufism. Sufism. Sufism is the esoteric tradition within Islam. So it's it's sort of like Kabbalah for, for Judaism or or maybe Gnosticism for, for Christianity. You know, most religions have a kind of esoteric side, right? So, and Sufism, you know, is often very deeply embedded uh, in Islamic culture. Uh, but in the United States, it takes a very different kind of form. Right. Uh, and the order that, that uh, my family belongs to is a very universalist uh, kind of branch uh, associated with uh, a fellow named Hazrat Anayat Khan, who taught Sufism in the West. Um, so, you know, that I grew up in a very kind of alternative, uh, background, um, but it wasn't very political, you know, there are, there are, uh, political hippies and non-political hippies, you know, and this, this is the, this is a non-political kind of strain. Um, but I got into, uh, radical politics, uh, as a young person when I was a, when I was a teenager. Yep. Uh, and it's at that point that I began to, to study Marxism and, I ended up uh, studying that quite seriously and studying in college and, and graduate school uh, with uh, the noted Marxist economist Richard Wolff uh, and his longtime collaborator, Stephen Resnick, who has now passed away, sadly. Uh, so that's kind of my, my training. And then I had the idea that I would really like to teach at a community college uh, because you know I, I, I want to be able to speak to working class people. And you know, it seemed like that was the best way to do it. Uh, now, there's a lot of challenges that come along with that. Um, but and that's what I've done for about the last 20 years. I did take five years out of that uh, and uh, ran a nonprofit. For, so I, I haven't always been an academic. Academic. I left and then I returned. Uh, and that's that's kind of my story. I currently, like you mentioned, teach at uh, Riverside City College in Southern California. Very cool. I appreciate that. By the way, if you don't mind going back, you said in high school you took interest in politics uh, and you were always, you know, upbringing, you know, and what you guys were studying, philosophy, all that stuff. But why, why, why Marxism? Why Karl Marx? Was there a teacher? Did somebody inspire you? Did you watch a movie? Did you read a book? Where did that inspiration come from? 
Yeah, it's a little hard to say at this point. I don't think there was a single kind of source. You know, I I was in an exploration kind of mode. Um, definitely, a book that interested me early on uh, was was by E. F. Schumacher, uh, and it's called Small Is Beautiful. This is not a part of the Marxist or communist canon. This is written by uh, a, a sort of mainstream or maybe kind of lefty economist, but it it. I found it to be very kind of um, freeing in terms of its outlook, um, and that and that was one of the one of the works that kind of set me on the path of discovery. I had a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with a kind of mainstream economics, which seemed to me just very abstract and and very hard to use, and and uh, that it didn't it didn't seem to connect with the kind of real problems that seemed to be happening uh, all around us, you know, it was, it was very, very stylized. And, and, and so I, I didn't understand like, why was that the case? Um, and, but then when I would read other things, I was like, Oh, okay. Well, these here they're talking about real stuff. Yep. Um, so that was sort of the beginning for me. So, so if I'm doing the math, right, 14 years old. Uh, so you're saying 1987 ish, 86 ish, who's president at the time. I think Reagan is president at the time. Milton Friedman is probably all over the place. Thomas Sowell is probably all over the place. So is it fair to say like it was maybe Friedman is on Phil Donahue and they're debating Nader, Ralph Nader, and some of that stuff just didn't sit well with you? Would you say Friedman was one of the guys that you didn't agree with? Well, yeah. I mean, Friedman is somebody I studied later uh, and somebody who certainly casts a long shadow uh, in the field. Uh, in the culture as a whole, um, uh, definitely, you know, an important intellectual figure in terms of, you know, what we could call the, the rise of neoliberalism or the the neoclassical counter-revolution that occurs because, you know, what happens, of course, in the post-war era is that Keynesian economics becomes really the dominant form of, of economic theory. And its focus is how can the state manage and regulate capitalism, right, to to the benefit of society. That's the kind of focus of, of Keynesian theory. And Friedman and the Chicago School uh, really systematically attacked Keynesian theory uh, in favor of you know, a, a stripped down kind of free market. And that's the, that's the neoliberal kind of philosophy, right? That the, the state should have a very minimal uh, role uh, in the economy. And, and they were, I think, broadly speaking, successful at you know, kind of moving the pendulum back towards a much more free market or classical liberal or neoliberal kind of position. Got it. And by the way, just out of curiosity, if you and I were in 10th grade together, who, who, who were you in 10th grade? Was I in 10th grade? <laughs> um, you know, I had in high school, I was it, sort of an introvert. Um, I, I did some sports, but they were the sort of nerdy sports, you know, I, I, <laughs> I rode crew and I ran track and, you know, like the sports that nobody cares about. Uh, I didn't much like, uh, you know, I, I like, I always liked athletics, but I didn't like the world of athletics all that much. You know, why is that? Um, it seemed like it was filled with bullies and douchebags, you know, and, uh, I, I, I love competition. I love athletic performance. Um, you know, I, I do martial arts. Uh, it's one of my hobbies. I do oh, judo yeah. and jujitsu and, and boxing. You know, I, I enjoy competition, but I don't enjoy uh, the putting down of the week. You know, um, I think competition should bring out your best, not be about, you know, putting down somebody else. And, and so it, it, but I often saw that, you know, in the, in the kind of world of sports and I, it turned me off. Yeah. I don't think that can be debated. I think uh, uh, there, there is a, a, a big part of that in sports. And uh, I can see that turning uh, some people off because there's the smack talk and the comparison. You know, sometimes maybe you can't compete with somebody else because they have certain abilities. Somebody else doesn't have certain features, certain things. So I can totally see that taking place. OK, so I kind of have an idea who you were in high school. Parenting, got it. Books, inspiration, got it. Coming out of high school, if you were to say like my hero, if I were to say coming out of high school would probably be, I don't know, an Arnold. I wanted to be Mr. Olympia. Right. I looked up certain people that were, you know, uh, 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 people I saw, maybe a military leader, somebody like that. Who was your hero coming out of high school, like in college? Well, it'd probably be 
someone more like Gandhi, to be honest, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I, I, I looked at Gandhi as a figure of, of national liberation for, for India as someone who was uh, very informed by, you know, spiritual experiences, spiritual views, uh, but also took an interest in, uh, you know, real politics and, you know, things like economic development and, um, so, you know, that certainly had a big impl- impact on me as a young person. Has that changed uh, to today? Have your, uh, has there been an evolution to your heroes? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who would you um, say today? Is, is your hero like a M&M? Is it a, you know, I don't know, maybe a uh, president? Is it a former author? Is it a live person? Is it a dead person? I don't think I relate as quite so much as I did as a young person to that concept of having a, a hero. You know, um, I think we are too individualistic about, you know, it, the role of individuals in terms of history. You know, Marxism is focused more on the collective mass of humanity, right? Uh, and the the philosophy of dialectics of, of overdetermination yeah. is about you know, how we kind of all matter, right? Not, not how, oh, it's just about, about one great man in history or whatever, you know? So, I, I mean, there, there's certainly lots of people that I look to and admire and say, these are people who made great contributions. Um, and let me just drop probably the most controversial one just right out the gate. And that is Joseph Stalin. Okay. Um, that's probably why I'm on the show uh, because I had some, viral tweets uh, back in the end of June, um, where, you know, I celebrated the legacy of Stalin. And, and these really sort of took over and started trending on Twitter. uh, And that that got me a lot of attention, which has been been interesting. (laughs) I bet you know, what's crazy is I have family members who admire Stalin. I mean, you got to realize my mother's side, their their majority of them are communists. You know, interesting, their their Bible was uh, Karl Marx, uh, uh, communist manifesto, they escaped, uh, they're Armenian. So you figure they were in Russia, you have Stalin, you have Lenin, they admired these men in many different reasons. And then they left, came to Iran, met my dad. My dad was an imperialist. So imagine an imperialist marrying a communist. You know this thing's not going to work out, right? Just a matter of <laughs> time. They got two divorces in 20 years. The second time they got remarried, I was born. So I'm kind of glad they got divorced twice, not once, because if it's only a one divorce, I don't exist. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read the tweet. I'm going to read the tweet and yeah, go ahead. If you can unpack it. So uh, people, well, you're not just going to read the initial one, right? Read, you're going to read the whole right, thread. It's a long one. So I'm going to go through the whole thing. You tell me okay. when to stop, right. I'll stop. <laughs> so uh, people say I idolize Stalin. Not true. I hold a fair and balanced view. The man was neither a savior nor saint, but he was at once a very successful revolutionary, a great contributor to Marxist theory and said to be a great listener and collaborator during discussions. And then there are his successes as a leader. First, the foresight to fear a belligerent German fascism, then the uh, tactical ability to successfully defeat the world's greatest invading army, combined with the strength to make tough decisions that have no easy answers. I simply think one should read everything the man wrote and then make up your own mind. I would certainly conclude that he is one of the great leaders of the 20th century, though. So that's what you said, if you don't mind unpacking that. That is the one that uh, caused Stalin to trend. And, and Twitter even wrote a little, a little editorial. I think Twitter felt that they had to explain this. you know. So they said, St- you know, trending, Stalin. And then it said, Dr. Asatar Bayer of Riverside City College right, has, has defended Stalin, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Somebody from Twitter had to try to summarize this situation. Um, yeah, the, that tweet got something like 20 million impressions. Um, and, you know, I wrote this knowing that this would probably be somewhat, let's say, triggering, right? Sure. Um, uh, you know, we are taught in the United States uh, because of anti-communist propaganda. You know, we're taught that Stalin is just an appalling monster, uh, and there's not a single thing that he did that was good. Um, and this is utter nonsense. Um, 
you know, the we look at the achievements of the Soviet Union, and what we find is that so, the Soviet Union improved the lives of ordinary people more rapidly than any any state has ever done in history. Now, that's a remarkable achievement. Uh, so we're talking about two two things here, right? First, we're talking about a massive expansion in the size of the economy, right? And when I say that, I'm talking about conventional measurements. I'm talking about GDP, right? Now, there are some differences in terms of how GDP is, is reckoned in socialist countries and so forth. Let's just leave that aside, right? The fact is that socialism under Stalin massively grew the economy more than at any other point in Russian history, right? Um, so that's one thing. Now, the second thing, GDP doesn't mean that much, though, uh, in terms of how the average person is doing, right? Because the size of the economy can grow and we have no idea, you know, where, where does that wealth go, right? Does it go to a small number of people? I mean, that's typically the pattern, right? Typically, I mean, Marx said, right, the history of hitherto existing society is a history of class struggle. That means a small group of people tends to take the lion's share of the wealth uh, of, of an economy, you know, and this is going back thousands of years, right? Um, did that happen in the Soviet Union? The answer is absolutely not, right? The wealth went towards improving the average person's life and, and especially towards improving the lives of the very poorest. That is extremely unusual, right? That is, in fact, it, they're, they're, at the time, there's no, there's no care cases of it. There's no parallel. There's absolutely no historical parallel. So before we get into, you know, the, this debate is carried out about, oh, Stalin murdered this and that, right? Stalin did this. You know, okay, look, before we even get into the details, you start with the big picture, you know? When you're approaching something from far away, right, you see certain, you know, there's the mountain, right? What does it look like, right? This is the mountain of so Soviet socialism, right? It's a rapid economic development, A, and B, rapid improvement, very rapid, right? History's rap most rapid improvement in the lives of the ordinary person. And I think that is a stupendous accomplishment, you know? Now, again, I'm not a fan of the great man theory, right? So I'm not saying, oh, Stalin, oh, we worship Stalin like this, right? Nonsense. That's not true for any leader of any modern country, right? I mean, you know, what leaders do is supported by millions of people, right? Um, one way or the other, you know? Um, so, but we can say, right, Stalin is, is the leader in, in, in a leadership role, right? And, and so, you know, he has certain responsibility, both positive and negative, right, for what happened under that, you know, 28-year period or so uh, of his leadership. Um, and I think it's a huge mistake to look at Soviet history and say, oh, that was an economic failure and, oh, people suffered and whatever. Um, well, look, you know, people suffer in every single society. Um, could they have done better? Maybe, right? Could they have done better economically? Maybe. But you start with the actual fact, right? The fact is the economy grew massively under Stalin, right? The economy industrialized quicker than any society ever industrialized. Um, and people's lives got a whole lot better, right? And, and how do we know that, right? We can look at that in terms of you know, the, the tools that social science has to measure that, right? Which are how long are people living? What's the life expectancy? How many babies are dying before age one, right? Um, how many calories are people taking in, right? Um, how many people can read? You know, these are the basics, right? And especially when you're dealing with a relatively poor, mostly agrarian society, a society where 92% of the people work in agriculture, right? These are monumental achievements. And that is why I celebrate that. I think it's it's a huge mistake and a huge distortion to allow the anti-communists, most of whom, by the way, are Nazis, to write this history. No, we can't we can't allow that, right? We have to have the true history. You said most may you just made a lot of uh, uh, assumptions right there. Some would say <laughs> and you said it in a confident way, which is pretty impressive. It's like going up to a girl at a bar and saying, listen, I'm going to be the greatest man you're ever going to take home. And she doesn't know until she takes you home. And then she says, you know what? You were like a four. You were okay. Or you were good and you delivered. So we don't know that. But let me go back and uh, measure a few things that you said. You know, one, by the way, you know, I've had uh, Richard Wolf on before and we had a great time together. I had him on 
and Slavoj Žižek's also been on and a few other socialists have been on. I love talking to socialists. It's a good conversation because I think the audience wins. So, you know, you said, you know, uh, what it did to the economy, it improved the average person's life. And, you know, yeah, let's not look at the amount of people that died. You know, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's, you know, you have to do what you have to do. And then leadership, there's some negative, there's some positive. The part I agree with you, to me, a leader is somebody that gets people to do something they wouldn't do on their own. That could be positive or negative. I think a criminal that says, hey, let's go rob the bank. I'm like, I don't want to do it. I'm telling you, we should go rob the bank. If I end up going and robbing a bank with a criminal, that guy was a leader who led me to go rob the bank. Now, does that mean he's a <laughs> good leader or a bad leader? I define him as a leader, but depends what he's leading sure. to doing. But, yeah. but, to, but to go back and say, you know, improving the average person's life, here's uh, uh, one of the challenges I have with that. If you, any history book you read, it doesn't matter where you read it, Stalin and Lenin are not seen as, you know, uh, heroes or Mao. The only places that you will read that's positive about them is typically their own country or somebody that's maybe favoring them that was from their lineage that, you know, says good things about them. But the biggest challenge with communism for me, and I want to kind of focus on this and then we can go any different angle you want to go. I got different topics we can go to. The, the concept of force versus choice. So who is the government to determine what improving means to me? Maybe I want to build my life at a different scale. Communism doesn't allow me to do that. Choice is eliminated under communism. Choice is there under capitalism. Communism's basic foundation is force and I know what's good for you. Now, you're going to disagree with that. So I want to know where you're going to go with disagreeing that, because I don't think communism exists without a level of force. Do you? I would say I would agree with everything that you said, but we have to change the term communism to capitalism. It is capitalism which gives us no choices. Right. The average person has nothing. Right. You cannot have freedom if you have nothing. OK, so. Now, when I say the average person has nothing, what does that mean, right? It means how much liquid wealth does that person have, right? Okay, so if we if we look at ninety percent of Americans, and you know, richest country in the world, right? How much liquid wealth, yeah, uh, do do people have? Um, the answer is almost none, right? Almost none. Now, even if when we start approaching the top ten percent, that answer does start to change, right? So the top 10% has wealth, but when we look at how much wealth they possess, almost all of it is illiquid, right? So almost all of the average person's wealth is in the form of their home, right? Now, at the average person does not own a home. They own a portion of a home, right? Home equity. But this is not wealth that you can use, right? Because the most you can do with that wealth is you can borrow against it, right? You're using it right now, right? You're living in it. So if you try and use it, you have an immediate problem, which is what, where do you live? You know, um, here's the question, right? Does the wealth that you have, even if you're at the 85th percentile or whatever, right? Even if you're sort of near the top of the, of the income distribution under capitalism, does it allow you to stop working and do whatever you want, right? Imagine if you could do whatever you thought would make you the most happy and be of the greatest benefit to humanity, right? Does it allow you to do that? The answer is no, absolutely not. Does it allow you to do that, right? And I can say this as a pretty privileged position, right? I mean, like, you know, people can look up my income if they want. You know, my critics do this sometimes on Twitter, you know, and they say, look at this communist who's all privileged and they get high income and whatever, right? Like, like one shouldn't or something as a PhD college professor, right? Um, you know, the, the point is, right, even if you're doing well on the income ladder, you probably have almost no wealth, right? And if you do have some, do you have enough that allows you to live off the proceeds and do whatever you want? The answer is no, except unless you're in the top 1%, right? Absolutely not. So if you want to talk about freedom, right? I, that's what I think of as freedom, right? I think freedom means you get to control your time. You get to decide what you do. I mean, that's the most precious resource that we have, right? I mean. Let's take that. I don't mind taking that. So let's go with that angle yeah. right there. So uh, 
You said everything you said I agree with, except I would replace communism with capitalism. Okay, so uh, a couple of different things there. The average person, you know, uh, wealth is measured based on liquid savings, not based on uh, uh, the income they make. Fine. Do you think it's the choice of the individual on how they spend their money? And do you think there are people that are better with their money than versus those who are not good with their money on how they spend their money. Some have good habits, some have bad habits, right? Like when you say, I'm a, a PhD and you're making good income, you earn the right to do that. You went and got your PhD. I think you, whatever you're making, whether it's 120, 150, 200, I haven't looked up your income. If you have the discipline to go, I haven't looked up your income, but if you have the discipline- You can look it up later. <laughs> yeah, but if you have the discipline to go get a PhD and you are a thought leader professor, if the market pays you good money, more power to you. But I think that, that's more based on the choice of the individual on how they spend their money. I got guys in my in, in sales that make a half a million dollars a year and they're killing it in income. They got $100,000 in savings because they got four Lambos. For what? You don't need four Lambos. Then I got guys that make $78,000 a year and they got $2 million in savings. So that argument gets stopped based on the habit of the individual on what they do with their money. Don't you agree? No, not at all. Because, you know, in order to in order to have the ability to save at that level, you have to have income at that level. You know, like, let's not act like the average person makes 78K or 200K or 500K, right? That's not, those are not average incomes, right? So, you know, the the if we want to talk about who is average, we need to talk about median figures, right? So the median household income in the United States, right? And this is household. So that includes every member of the household, right? So there's about a little over two members of the household on average, right? In the United States, 160 or so million households. Um, so the average is about, about 60K, right? So that means half make below that and half above that, right? Sure. Now, income is not the whole story though, right? Now, well, look, I should just say, just to finish that point, right? We are dealing with masses of people who don't really have the option to save because their, their cost of living is so high relative to their, to their income, right? And because rents have been rising much faster than incomes have, right? There's unemployment. I mean, these are the, the constant problems of capitalism. Capitalism has such an emphasis on employment, but does it guarantee everyone a job? Not at all, right? Do you think even under good times, you, you have millions of people who are looking for work and can't find it? Do you? How much um, of it do you think is on the individual to increase their market value? Well, individuals can certainly do that, right? You can. I mean, I I'm sort of in the business of encouraging people to do that, right? Go to school, yep. get your get get your AA, right? Get your get your BA, get your BS, you know. Um, but is everybody going to do that? I mean, I think it's it's sort of cruel to tell everyone, uh, hey, listen, we've got to cross this river. Uh, nine of you are going to make it. One of you is going to drown. Good luck. You know, like, yeah, but wow, maybe that you sounds... Could say, maybe you could say, look, you kind of eat a little too much and you put on too much weight. Maybe discipline yourself a little bit so you can have stamina a little bit more. You can say, you know, what's wrong with us saying... Look, instead of watching Netflix all day and playing video games, maybe spend that same amount of time learning a new skill set so the market could increase your value. Is there anything wrong with that? Is that cruel? I think it's unrealistic. You know? How do you say that? Because we need to look at the fact it's like it's like musical chairs, right? Musical chairs, the whole point of the game is there's not enough chairs, right? It wouldn't be much of a game if when the music stopped, everybody had a, a place to sit down. That's, you know, a, game, they don't, though. Right? That's a game. That's a game. Sure. But our economy is not that different from musical chairs, right? I mean, like, there's always going to be millions of people unemployed. I mean, we can look at the lowest unemployment figures in the series, right? And what does it translate into? It translates into several million people unemployed. I mean, that's just the reality, you know? Every 1% of unemployment is 1.6 million people or thereabouts, right? So you always have millions of people unemployed, in, even in the richest capitalist nations, you just hope it's not you, right? You just hope that you hustle hard enough and it's not you. I call that cruel. Yes, absolutely that's cruel. Because we are saying, look, somebody always has to suffer, right? That's a structural cruelty. Do you have any kids? Yeah. Do, you have, do you have any kids? I do. I have two kids. They are 11 and 14. 11 and 14. Do, yeah. uh, do, do you feel 
they uh, have to contribute to society and where they're living today? Do they have any responsibilities or no? Yeah, everyone has to contribute to society, and I think everybody does. You know, you think I think when does? you say that, you mean in a formal employment capacity. No, right? I just I got four kids. I got four kids, and I think about yeah. like, for example, like what the part I agree with is when somebody's coming up. Like, listen, you got to kind of give me an opportunity to kind of build myself up, and then like, you know, uh, the culture of Middle Eastern culture. You know, sometimes in America, it's like you turn eighteen, go figure it out on your own. Versus, hey. Listen, let me give you a little bit of a head start and then go and do your thing, you know, so but some right. may go out and be independent at 18 and never come back. But some may go at 28, 26, 25. It varies. I totally understand that part. But to think that an individual doesn't have to contribute to society, isn't that a miserable life to not have any way to contribute positively to the world? I think it is. Okay. I think it is. Okay. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of dignity and nobility in labor. Right? Sure. And we have been given a wrong picture of labor by capitalism, in fact, right? We think of labor as work, as toil, as trouble. I mean, it's this is all through the economics literature, by the way, right? This goes back to Adam Smith, right? It's, the, it's toil and trouble, man. Man lives by the sweat of his brow, right? This goes back to the Bible, in fact, right? So, you know, these are ideas about labor that says labor is intrinsically unpleasant, you know? Now, I don't think that's deal. true. Yeah, it doesn't. I don't have think to. that's true. Yeah. Yeah, no, you say it doesn't have to be, right? Uh, I think there's two different versions of that, okay? There's one version of that, which is a kind of capitalist version that says, yeah, look, work doesn't have to be shitty, but it will be if it's low wage. So don't be stuck in a low wage shitty kind of job, right? That's the kind of capitalist version. The Marxist version says no work is shitty, right? What makes work crappy is the exploitation, the alienation, the low wages, the precarity, the fact that you never know, right? Is your wage actually going to even keep up with the cost of living, right? Those are the things that make work crappy. It's not the work itself, right? People say, well, who's going to pick up the garbage? This is a funny one to me because people that pick up the garbage, this is tends to be a pretty good job, actually, right? Like, you know, sanitation workers have good unions. They tend to have good wages, good benefits. It's a good job, right? Lots of people would be very happy to have a good job as a sanitation I worker. So. Right? Yeah. 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 So, you know, people always say this to me under socialism, right? Well, who's going to pick up the garbage? I don't you know. Nobody wants to do that, right? I don't think that's true, right? People want to be of service to society as long as they are getting their needs met, right? Okay, so there I mean, are no unpleasant kinds of jobs, but there are there are ways of structuring them that yeah. make them crappier or make them better, depending on how they're structured. So then, then what you're saying is what you're saying is there are some shitty capitalists, you can't debate that. There are some that are very uh, uh, selfish, all they care about is themselves and they don't treat their employees right. Fine. Who do you think of when you when you think of a capitalist like that? I mean, just who springs to mind? I mean, I'm sure you're going to say Bezos. You're probably going to bring up Bezos or you're going to bring up probably, I don't know, who are you going to say? Who's uh, the modern day guy you would bring up? Musk? Bezos? I don't know who you would bring up. Who would you say? I don't know. I mean, those, I, those guys I, definitely I get a lot of press. You, because the way I see it is in the following way. I see it as if you and I are friends, okay? Let's just say you and I are friends. We have opposing beliefs. I got a lot of friends that we have political difference. I got them here. I mean, we, we have a podcast with a guy. We don't see eye to eye on politics. But see, you and I go to dinner together, okay? All right, we go to dinner. I got you. Don't worry about it, doc. This is on me. What do you want? You want wine? It's on me today. Don't worry. I got the sushi today. Great. We go. You know, I treat you good. We have a good friendship together. I respect you. I respect your 14 and your 11-year-old kid. I respect your family. I see them. Hey, anything I can get you. Is there anything I can do for you? Great. And you're respectful to me. We're probably going to have a long-term relationship together, friendship together, and we're going to enjoy each other's company. We don't have to agree on everything, but we're going to. But if I treat sure. you shitty, if I betray you, if I disrespect your kids or your family, we're probably not going to be friends for too long because you're not going to put up with it. And I don't think 99.9% .9 of people will put up with it. So what does that mean to me? The market who is filled with people who make their money and they become arrogant and mistreat people, they're the ones that make others who take care of their employees well, 
their clients well, they make them look good. So you almost need a little bit of that to get somebody to say, you know what? I got to tell you, I used to work at John's place, man. He treated me like crap. But man, I love working for Mary. I've been with her for 11 years. Every time I've done well, she's given me a raise. I've gotten a bonus. She's good to my family. I go on vacation. She's given me plenty of when I had my two kids, I had my leave time, I had this, I had that. So I think there is the good and the bad, but I think the bad makes the look, makes the good uh, a win. Because, you know, like a lot of times on the socialist side or the communist side, the first person they like to target is Bezos. And like Sanders will go after him or AOC will go after him. Look at this guy. He doesn't take care of his people and he treats them like shit and all this other stuff. Guess what? I got a person here that's my camera girl. She didn't like working at Amazon. She said, I didn't want to work there. It didn't treat me good. She left. No one's forced to stay there. In communism, you don't have a choice. It's pure force. In capitalism, if you work for a shitty boss or a shitty company, you can leave them to go to a different place. You can do that in capitalism. You cannot do that in communism. Yeah, but what's your fallback, right? Let's say you don't have the money to leave a job, you know? Let's say you don't have any savings because you're a low-wage worker, right? Why are you a low-wage worker? Well, you don't have much skills. Why? Well, because you come from a poor family, you know? Education wasn't available to you. Acquiring skills wasn't available to you. Now, this is true for a substantial portion. Now, you could say, okay, hustle harder, you guys. Okay, fine. You know, hustling harder is going to work for a few people. Absolutely. You know, and that's great. Capitalism has some social mobility. It is better than the f- brutal system of feudalism. It's better than the brutal system of slavery that preceded it. Absolutely. And Marxists are, you know, very m- willing to admit that, you know, <laughs> like, like, are we trying to return to the corrupt monarchies of the past? No, fuck them. Fuck the kings, right? Like, are we trying, are we saying slavery was better? Absolutely not. It's a great thing that humanity has abolished slavery. It's fantastic, yeah. right? Uh, we celebrate that. We always have, right? Um, but are we going to celebrate a system of exploitation that requires, that needs, and that will always create a low-wage group, which is on the edge <clears throat> of subsistence and cannot develop themselves as full human beings? Because how can one, right, when you're all, every, all, almost every waking moment goes to enriching somebody else, right? That's the actual reality of capitalism. I mean, you know, you could celebrate for me the relatively small number of forward-thinking woke capitalists. They're, they are, they exist. They are out there. You know, there are good employers. There are, you know, you know who gets a lot of press is this guy, Dan Price. You know, that's that. I've had him on, by the way. I had him on like yeah. four months ago. Okay, well, you know the you know you know him then, right? Yeah, um, had him on. So pay the workers well, and they'll do well, and yeah, you know this is this is an enlightened capitalism, right? I say it's a illusion. You know, I say yeah, there's a few of them, fantastic, right? They make life better than it would be otherwise, but it's still a brutal system. You know, like when I say capitalism doesn't guarantee you a job, that's true, right? And that's not all it doesn't guarantee. It doesn't guarantee you a house, right? So this is why we have over half a million homeless people in the United States, right? Capitalism generates poverty. It does not lift people out of poverty. It generates poverty because it concentrates wealth in a few hands. That is its primary mechanism. I mean, I, are there times where societies decide to go against that for whatever reason? Yeah, there are. You, but they are at constant risk of getting undone. And this is what we're seeing, right? The places that have nationalized healthcare, let's take Britain, for example, their healthcare system is quite beleaguered, right? Yeah. Because they yeah. underfund it. Why? Because capitalists don't want to pay for it, right? Because it benefits everyone rather than benefiting a select few. Capitalism is all about generating mechanisms that redistribute wealth toward the rich. And then lying to us and telling us that's for the average person. That's not for the average person. So here, not at all. Here's a question for you. Here's a question for you. Yeah. So by the way, Dan Price, do you agree with his philosophy or no? What do you think about him? Well, he's trying to be a good capitalist employer. I think it's better to be a good capitalist employer than to be a bad capitalist employer, okay. if you ask me. Yeah, right? I mean, the, the part when I asked him, I said, so at the company, he pays everybody 70000 and now it's been a different story. I think he had some issues with his brother, lawsuit, family. Some things that happened wasn't pretty. Uh, but uh, I asked him, I said, who owns the company? He said, I own 100%. I said, that means you own a $100 million company. He says, yes. And then he changed his position afterwards. The guy's worth $100 million. His people are working for him, but he owns all the equity. So it's not like he's given right. the shares of the company. So if you if your position, I applaud you for sticking to your position of where you are. But let me go back to it. So a uh, question, what's more important, 
living out my purpose and ambitions or living a safe and guaranteed life? What's more important? I don't know what you can say to that to an individual, right? Like, you know, sh should you not be allowed to live out your purpose? Of course you should, right? But should, should somebody starve so that you can do that, right? I mean, see, the, this is the disconnect, right? We need a system that truly frees people to uncover themselves and achieve, right? To be who they can be, to develop their potential, right? Yep. Think of the millions of people who are systematically denied that opportunity, right? Because of simple stuff, right? Hunger, you know? At, at any given moment, okay, there are 850 hung, million hungry people yeah. in the world right now, right? And 9 million of them will ultimately starve, right? Each year. That's globally, right? That's an incredible figure, right? Um, there's another 3.5 million people that die from lack of access to clean water. So are you going to tell me that you can achieve your potential in life? when you don't even have clean water, right? I mean, what happens when a person doesn't have clean water? They drink dirty water. And then what happens? They get an infection, you know? I mean, they're much more likely, not everyone, right? Thank God, but you're much more likely to die. And there's a lot of ways you can die from drinking dirty water, right? Um, another million and a half people die just because they don't get the most basic kind of medical care, right? Vaccine preventable illnesses. So I would say capitalism kills 14 million people each and every year. Come on, man. You, that is an unbelievable. Now. You're reading that is a, now. No, that is absolutely due to capitalism. All right. So, right. so then. Let me make the connection for you if you're oh, interested. I, I've seen the video. I've seen the end, but go ahead. Audience hasn't seen it. Go ahead. All right. So what capitalism does, again, concentrates resources in a few hands, okay? When did this happen? If we look at the period from 1870 to 1900, okay? This is when capitalism conquered the world, Okay. This took the form of, now some of it had already been conquered at this point, right? India had already been conquered. China, you know, is subjugated, never fully colonized. 1870, 1900 is the scramble for Africa, okay? This is a period of time where a lot of the world's land changes hands, okay? It goes from indigenous control to European control, control under a few hands. You end up with African countries in which 80% of the land is owned by the colonizers, right? Now people want to tell me that has nothing to do with starvation today. It has everything to do with starvation today. What caused that imperialism? Well, it was caused by the competition among the capitalist powers for resources, for markets, to, keep, to get access to those commodities and keep out their competition, right? It emerges inexorably from the logic of capitalism. The world that has been created, the world that we see today, is the product of that, right? So that structural cruelty is inseparable from the system and will never be undone by capitalism, according to me. By the way, you know, that that part, the, the only way that kind of cruelty is possible is with the power of government. You cannot do it without the government. You need to have yeah. the government to do that. Right. So, so for me, if that did happen, I guarantee you the government was involved. For example, monopoly. Of course, you, the government was involved. You cannot create a monopoly without the help of a government. It's mathematically impossible to have a monopoly without the help of a government, to have some lobbyists come behind closed doors and help you out. But I, I'm going to go a different uh, direction with you on this. So, so I asked the question at the beginning, what's more important, pursuing my purpose, ambition, or pursuing you know, uh, what do you call it? Just a guaranteed safe life to make sure everybody else is happy and everybody else living a safe life becomes more important than my own desires that I have. Let's just say right now, we got a 22 year old kid that's watching this conversation. You and I are talking, let's call him John. Okay. Let's call him Jose. He's watching this video and he's sitting there saying, okay, doctor's got a degree. He's a PhD. Patrick had a one point GPA in high school. He doesn't have a degree. He doesn't have an eight year, not an MBA, not a PhD, not a four year, not an associate. He just went in the military, came out, went into a business and he's done well for himself in business. Fine. This kid that's watching this has the choice and the capacity to go be the next Bezos and build the next Amazon. Hypothetically, 
And he's in there where he has that kind of drive and intellect to be able to pull it off, right? The 22-year-old Bezos named Jose, okay? If he goes and does this in the next 20 years, Doc, he's going to create 1.3 million jobs, which is roughly what Amazon employs today. They got 1.3 million jobs. That means they created the market 1.3 million jobs. Or he can choose to go out there and become a major loyalist to Marxist and communistic philosophies, go into school, become a professor, and educate people on why capitalism is cruel and it's not the right system. Who's living more of a worthier life? The guy that gives 20 years to build an incredible company that creates 1.3 million jobs, or the guy that goes out there and says, capitalism sucks and communism is the way to go? Who's Who's making their purpose become a reality? I think if we're dreaming, I would like to see the uh, the Marxist figure be more of a revolutionary, actually. <laughs> Fine. Let's say he's a revolutionary. Let's say he's the next Stalin. Let's say he's the next Lenin. Let's say he's the next Karl Marx. Do you think the world's a better place if this kid chooses to become the next Karl Marx or the next Jeff Bezos? Well, we have to distinguish between these figures, these historical figures, right? Because Marx is a theoretician, right? If we say what are, what are the results that Marx generated for yeah. people's lives, the answer is zero, right? Marx was never in a position. Marx was never in a position to do any policy, right? So now Stalin, that's a different story, right? Stalin is actually the leader of the Soviet Union, right? So and he is in a position to have an impact on ordinary sure. people's lives, and he did have an impact on ordinary people's lives, right? So these are very different figures historically, right? We have to distinguish between a theoretician, right, somebody who generates theory. Uh, now, theory is good, right? Let's set aside. Let's affects set our aside. understanding of the world, right? Um, hey, let's say so, Bezos against Stalin. Yeah, yeah. Well, which one improved more people's lives? You going to ask me this? Yeah, 100%. The answer is unquestionably Stalin. You really right? believe unquestionably. that? You really believe that? Oh, absolutely. That's not, it's not even close. Not even close. You, now, look, generating 1.3 million jobs is not the unambiguous good that you're making it sound like, right? The That's question is, what's the nature... The question is, what's the nature of those jobs, right? I could create 1 million internships for you right now. Okay. They're unpaid, right? I just created a million jobs. Amazon Boom. Pay jobs. Oh, they, they do pay jobs, right? Yeah. Imagine if, if, if my internships were also paid, they're just paid at a starvation level of wages, right? Is that a net improvement? These, these are not starvation paid jobs, though. You know, when, well, when Amazon, that's not Amazon, what the Amazon workers say, is it? You know, well, no, the I mean, people, the people, listen, the part that you're right is when the complaints come about breaks and other people have said that, right? But if we have to choose between the two, you're saying without a debate, Stalin would be better for the world than a Bezos. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the historical record is very, very clear on that, right? Wow. Now, look. How long were people living in the Soviet Union under the czar, right? The life expectancy in the Soviet Union was about 40 years, right? Yeah. So this is an average figure, all right? So what it means is, let's take everybody who died, okay, and just put in their age, okay? You died at six months, okay, we'll put in 0.5. If you died at 80, we'll put in 80, okay? Died at 40, put in 40, all right? The average of all those numbers, okay? That is unbelievable, right? And that shows you that this is a pretty brutal society, okay? So Stalin improved that by about 30 years, right? This is almost a doubling in life expectancy, and this occurred in a very short he period of time. He killed millions of people. He killed well, millions of people. Let's not deflect, right? Let's just let's just say what happened, right? What happened was At the cost massive of investment of in healthcare, right? At the cost We're talking about of training thousands and thousands of doctors building hospitals where they never existed before, right? Did that save lives? At the yes. cost of millions of people, though. Well, let's get to the cost in a moment, right? We're just on the positive side of the ledger right yeah. now, right? Did that save lives is the question. And the answer is, there is no question that that Whoever saved lives. And we're talking they, about they, lives on a grand scale. Okay, so this is a nation of about 160 million people, okay? Yeah. So when we say that life expectancy on average increased by about three decades, how many years of human life are we talking about, right? We're talking about hundreds of millions. That is absolutely astonishing, okay? 
Now, people say, oh, maybe the czar could have done that. Yeah, maybe, but the czar didn't do that, right? There is, in fact, no capitalist nation that has seen that kind of increase in that span of time. No capitalist nation, right? So did people's lives get better? Yes, it's unequivocal. Now, if we want to get into, okay, Stalin killed millions, that's a detailed argument. Let's, let's get into it, though, right? Let's get into it. Because now we're on the negative side, right? So we've established the pro. What's the cost to all this, right? I'm listening. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So let's let's deal with the charges. Okay. The biggest charge against Stalin is that Stalin intentionally caused a famine in the Ukraine in 1932. Okay. So this is called the Holodomor thesis, right? And you know this has been propagated. Uh, you know, since since about the 1930s, so since about the time that it happened, not shortly after, right? Um, and it was the story was originally created by Hearst, right? William Randolph Hearst. Hearst sent this guy named Thomas Walker, okay, to the Soviet Union to go and observe, right? But Walker never went to the Ukraine, right? We know this, right? Because we know we have his train tickets and stuff, right? He never went to the Ukraine. Um, came back and told a story which Hearst was very willing to print, right? And then they used pictures that were from the Volga famine. They were from the, the Bengal famine. I mean, you know, they, they, so they used a bunch of misleading pictures, right? And tried to cook up this narrative that said the Soviets intentionally starved Ukraine. This argument never had any logic behind it. What the Soviets wanted to do was rapidly industrialize. And they knew they had to increase agricultural productivity. There is no logical basis for any Soviet official anywhere ever wanting to damage agricultural productivity. Their entire, their entire focus was increasing it, right? So you would have to convince me, right? Okay, that's the logic. Well, maybe somebody went bad. Maybe somebody, let's show me the order then, all right? Here's the, here's the order. Okay, punish Ukraine, okay, starve them, right? Well, of course, there's no order. In fact, what we find is the opposite, right? When the famine began, the Soviets shipped them grain. They said, drain the grain reserves, right? Ship them the grain right away. Oh, we happen to be exporting grain so that we can get foreign exchange to industrialize. Slash that, right? That's what they did. There's never been any kind of good argument that said the Soviets intentionally, or let alone Stalin, intentionally starved people. That is in fact, the truth is the opposite. The Soviets ended the problem of famine, you got which had a me. long history in Russia. You got to be kidding me! Let me ask you a question: Have you ever been to Russia? I haven't. Why not? I would love to go. I haven't been able to travel the world because of you. Make pretty good well, money. You can go. You're a good-looking uh, guy. You look like you could be Russian. Why haven't you gone to Russia yet? Oh, I didn't realize that they distributed airline tickets on the basis of your appearance. I should, I should have, <laughs> I should have asked I'm that. Saying, you think I'm good looking enough PhD, to be able to go to Russia? <laughs> PhD professor salary, you make pretty good money. But I would love to you, go. You, you know how it is when you have a family and you have kids and you have a house and you know where you. you know. If, if I love the country as much as you love Russia, shit, I'd go live there. I don't know why you don't live there. Yeah, yeah, you. So, so, but, but honestly, let me ask you this: Russia is not currently a socialist country, though. You, you understand that. Let right? me ask you a question, though: Would you rather live in a capitalistic country or a communistic country? You know, I don't like this question because <laughs> I feel like I feel like it presupposes that the world works like this. You just move wherever in the world makes you the most happy. You know, I don't think that's how the world works. Do you? I do. Yes. I do. For the rich, perhaps. Not not for the rich. No, no. For those who want freedom and they want to avoid force. Shit. I didn't come to America to be rich. My dad was a cashier at a 99 cent store. We lived in Germany at a refugee camp for two years. We escaped Iran six weeks after Khomeini died. I lived in Tehran, Iran for 10 years. After Jimmy Carter pushed out the Shah, saying the fact that Khomeini was going to give everybody free housing, free food, free rice, free phones, free TV, he came and he killed Half a million people's lives. I mean, it was a treacherous type of an environment. My mother's family escaped Armenia and Russia and Baku to come to Iran because of what Lenin, Stalin, communism did to many of these guys. They escaped this. This is life. Like, so for you to say people come only for money. No, man, we came here because 
Well, I can't tell somebody, my mom, I'm a, I was an atheist for 25 years. I don't believe in God for 25 years because the stuff I saw, it's very hard to believe in a God. If a God really exists, why the hell would he make this kind of stuff happen? But we couldn't tell people we were Christians. I couldn't tell mm. people that stuff in Iran. You know, my mother couldn't go out there and have the kind of career that men, men have here. You couldn't do that. Women were forced to be able to marry a man that's 40 years their age at eight years old, 13 years old. You, that's not cool to do that. So when you say why people leave, it's just for money. No, people go to places because that country's values and principles match theirs. I didn't come to America because I wanted handouts. I didn't come to America to be a billionaire. We came here because I just wanted to be able to say, hey, doc, what? I disagree with you. Cool. I disagree with you. Screw you. Screw you. Cool. Can we have dinner? Yeah. Awesome. I can't do that in Iran. I can't do that in the communist regimes. I can't do that in China. I got a zip well, in China. Now, hold on a minute. I'm not celebrating Iran here, right? And no, nor no, am no, I you're saying not celebrating that you guys Iran. left because of money or whatever. I'm celebrating I said, Iran. You're celebrating I said that Iran. the rich have the option to go wherever in the world they'd like to go. We weren't typically. rich, though. We weren't rich. We were very poor. Right. We were very and, poor. And no doubt you guys suffered in the way that refugees oh, suffered. I mean, fully. You wouldn't, you it's wouldn't. not easy to move to another country. I mean, I think anybody knows this, right? Unless you're very rich, in which case it's easy. We were not rich. No, we were not. We, I've never lived in a house before. Listen, in, yeah. I never lived in a house. I lived in a two-bedroom apartment complex with my mom and dad. And my dad left at 5 a.m., came home at 9 p.m. We, we had a very rough life. I'm not, I don't like sympathy. I don't like that kind of stuff because I don't want you to feel bad for me. I, I'm a very happy man, lucky man. All I'm saying to you is none of your values and principles that you admire are any of those that America stands for. How could you live in a country that doesn't match any of your values and principles? I think those are American values. And here's why. Okay. If I go, I could, I could talk in front of a giant stadium yeah. full of Republicans. And you know what I'd say to them? What's that? I'd say, how many of you guys have jobs? Yes, we have jobs, right? I say, how many of you are proud of the work that you do, right? Yes, right? How many of you do you think everybody should have a job? Everybody who wants to work should have a job. Is there anything more American than working hard and being proud of what you do, yeah, right? Sure. I think we'd all be on the same page. Well, those are the values in the United States. Those are the values of Marxism, right? Yeah, but I mean, and yet we have this dream in the United States that if we get rich enough and if we succeed, then we can do what? Stop working, right? I mean, when you win the lottery, oh, look, and now I'm going to kick back and go in a hammock and do nothing, right? That's kind of our fantasy. Let me ask you a question. Right? How hard was it to get a PhD? How hard was it to get a PhD? It was hard. It was, it was perhaps the most difficult thing that I did in my young life. Are you, you know what happens when I see a guy that got a PhD? You, you, like, let me tell you how I view a PhD person. I see somebody with a PhD. I admire them. I see somebody with a PhD and I say, this guy must have freaking put shitload of hours into reading and studying and improving. Probably had to say no to a lot of parties. He probably partied a little bit, but I think he had to say no to a lot of them. He probably had That's to true. no to a lot of events. He probably had a lot of Friday nights and Saturdays and Sundays while everybody else was going kicking back. He probably stayed and studied. It ain't easy to get a PhD. So here's a question. Now, you and I go to school together. I go to college with you. We're bunk. Let's just say we're roommates. And I say, hey, bro, what's that? Let's go get hammered tonight. No, dude, I'm going to study for my this test that's coming up. Screw it. Caroline's coming. Mary's coming. Let's go. You get together with Caroline. I'm going to get together with Mary. You know, Caroline likes you. Dude, I'd love to, but I got a freaking. Who's the wingman here? Am I the wingman? I or, think or you, you would. Wingman? I think I'm a, I'm a historically good wingman, but I think you would also be a good <laughs> wingman. But the, All right. the point I'm trying to make to you is you busted your ass to get your PhD. How about the guy that partied instead of wanting to bust his ass? We need to take care of him. He could have the same hours to put into it. That's my I biggest think, concern. Yeah, I can give a very clear answer Please. to this. Yes, everyone should have a decent life. Just by, but just by virtue of being alive and being human, right? That means everyone should have food, clothing, I, shelter. They should have a up. job. What if I'm an F up? What if I? Some people to... are, unfortunately, what right? Some people are. Do drugs all day. What if I? Everyone should all... have a decent life. That should be our minimal understanding, right? Just like we have a very broadly shared understanding right now, right? Which is that no one should be enslaved. You know, 
I mean, ask a thousand people, you get a thousand people who will agree with that statement. Should people be enslaved? No, they should not, right? Why not? Is it because slavery is not profitable? No, slavery is incredibly profitable, right? For the slave master. Of course, right? communists know that. Communism is pure slavery. I mean, that's the, the system is... The well, no, now, we're, now we're just mixing up terms, right? Com communism so, is purely slavery. You if, better you, do if you ask a thousand workers under capitalism, yeah. right? Even in the United States, just ask everyone. Do you think everybody should have a job? Do you realize right now? I think you're going to get pretty strong agreement on that. David is sitting right here. He's a camera guy. Okay. Yeah. And he, he runs production. If David right now comes and tells me, screw you, Patrick, you're the worst boss ever. And he leaves. <laughs> me, what can I do to him? David, I don't want you to get you fired here. Yeah, yeah, well, what I'm trying to tell you is <laughs> what, what can I honestly do to David? What can I do to you? Nothing. He gets up and walks out. If in a communistic regime, he comes and puts his finger at the boss and says, screw you, where the hell are you going? What's going to happen to this guy? Poor guy may go missing. We may not find him. By the way, let's just say David works for me. And he goes on. Well, we don't find that historically, though. We don't find that. That's not I mean, just 40 million people got killed. That's not that many people. That's just not, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just. Yeah, but that's not a true number, though. It's That's probably 60 million. You're right. It's more like 60 million. It's a bigger number. No, but, no. Neither of those numbers are actually. <laughs> you, know, you, you, know, you, know you know what I appreciate about you is the following. Here's what I appreciate about you is you, you have your own thoughts on believing the data that a Stalin's regime would give you to say that's the data on how things got better. For somebody that is an intellect like you, who's read way more books than I have and knows history probably a lot more than I do, that's the world you're in. That's the sport you're playing, right? That's why I'm interviewing you and I have you on to get your perspective on it. Sure. You know, but let me ask you this. Yeah. Does not every government have similar motivations to lie about the numbers? I mean, doesn't the United States have similar motivations I don't disagree to make itself look good I don't disagree by lying about the numbers? But the only difference we have here, here's the only difference. Here's the only Remember who charged this? Trump did. When Trump was running, he made a lot of hay out of this. He said, the official unemployment rate is nonsense. The unemployment rate is that. actually I way that. higher. I remember right? that. But guess what? Yeah. You, know, you know what we have? Here's what we have. You, you just validated my point I was about to make to you. Here's the point I'm going to make to you is, okay, Ma uh, China, Xi Jinping, right? They say, yeah, COVID came and it left and we're freaking partying our asses up. Well, it's a big deal. We're good. The economy is growing. We're blowing up. People are so happy to be in China. They just love it here. It's a fantastic world. But I tell you, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, you're not welcome in China. And if somebody posts a video on any of those platforms, let me tell you, we're coming after you. Why? Jack Ma gets up there and gives a speech, an anti-government speech by this much. He goes missing for 90 days. How the hell does a guy worth $60 billion that created a bunch of jobs disappear? Uh, their Elon Musk disappeared. Their Bezos disappeared just because they made a comment against the government. Moral of the story is the following. You can get up today and talk shit about Biden. You got a job at Fox News and CNN. You can get up there and talk shit about Trump. You definitely have a job at MSNBC. Try getting up there and talk shit about Xi Jinping in China. You have a job at the cemetery and it's six feet under. You cannot talk shit over there or in Russia. You don't have that. That's not true at all, though. That's not true. Fantastic. So why, so, so why don't they believe in freedom of speech? Why, why don't we have Facebook, YouTube, Twitter over there? Why can't we see what's going on? Why don't they go Facebook Live so we can see what's going on in China? Well, you have to understand the history of China, right? China is a long established civilization that was very severely humiliated and basically colonized, right? Not exactly, but basically, right? The, the Britain had its way with China. It did not deign to conquer the entire territory, but it shaved off the part that it wanted, right? Hong Kong, you know, the, the, the port part, right? Um, uh, and it got the policies that it wanted that came out of the Opium Wars. Um, it subjugated China, right? So, and, you know, this caused, I mean, you know, this is part of a whole string of different defeats and humiliations in the early 20th century, right? That led to, uh, you know, the downfall of the Qing dynasty and the warlord period and Chinese nationalism and ultimately communism, right? Um, this is China just saying to the capitalist powers of the world, it's just saying no, right? You are not going to run our country. We are going to run our country. Now, that's a very important moment, right? Now, does the does the capitalist world say, oh, fine. Okay, thanks. Have a great day, right? No, they do not, right? They say, we are going to bring you the fuck down. 
by any means necessary. Okay. We're going to bring you down through infiltration. We will bring you down through planting people inside your government. We will bring you down through outside media. We will create an entire organization called Radio Free Asia, right? Just designed to spread lies and propaganda, right? So does China ban a few, as many of these things as they can? Yeah. And should they? Absolutely, they should, right? Would the United States do that? Would no. the United States ban things like that? No. If there was a massive, hugely funded Chinese effort There's to spread everywhere. propaganda in TikTok, the United States, TikTok, would, Zoom. would the U.S. ban it? No, TikTok and Zoom. What I mean, what else you want to say? TikTok, Zoom, go to the sites. We have access. I can go to China's YouTube website. They can't go online. Do, do you think that, t- I don't know how familiar you are with Radio Free Asia. Radio Free Asia is a completely propaganda outfit. It is funded by the State Department. Okay. Do, do you think that TikTok is equivalent to Radio Free Asia as a propaganda mechanism? Or, or do you not know enough about these things to say? Or do you have a sense? I have a sense of the fact that in China, you don't have freedom of speech like we got in America. In America, if you disagree with Trump, you can go out there and talk about it. You cannot do that in China. You cannot do that in the USSR that you love. You can't do that in under Stalin. Do you say one? No, you, you, no. There's plenty of criticism of of Xi Jinping. There's plenty of criticism of, you of think, the Communist you think, Party. You think during a Stalin era, I can say things about Stalin, get away with it? Come on, we can't be that naive. You cannot. You cannot organize to bring down the state. Not, not organize that, to bring the state. Have a problem. What if I just start to behind closed doors campaign and I say, hey. I want to run as an opposition against you, and I want to run as a Democrat. You can't do that. Their red line is, look, you can run. You can run against anybody as long as it's in the Communist Party, right? Why is that? Well, because there's a long history of capitalist powers funding oppositional candidates, right? Trying to bring down the system, again, through a million different means. If you study the history of U.S. imperialism and U.S. intervention, you will find an unbelievably long list of dirty tricks, right? These dirty tricks have been used everywhere to bring down governments that are democratically elected, right? I'm never going to defend a, uh, uh, you know, like the Taliban against the Afghanistan war. Okay, listen, if you go out there and get involved in everyone's business, and then you all of a sudden want to step away, I'm sorry, America, but you're going to create a lot of enemies. And America's created a lot of enemies. War involvement, a lot of different business. You and I are probably going to agree on that part because some of this stuff, when I was in Iran and they hated U.S. and they would scream Matic Bad on uh, America, like death upon America. Yeah, right. they don't like the westernized philosophy. But what I'm saying to you is all of those tactics fair. Yes. But dude, in America, you and I can get up and talk. Tra- in America, you can be a professor at Riverside, you know, City College. And you're a full on communist. You are a full blown communist. And you yeah, can- but do you know how many people are surprised by that? I mean, take a guess at how many have called for my job publicly out of those Stalin remarks, right? You know, like how 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 powerful a person do you think it would take? I don't think to, you to get me you, fired. I don't think you would get fired. Well, you know, th- thank you. And I sincerely hope that you're right. <laughs> you know, in fact, I'm staking my livelihood on that. No, right? I don't think you would get fired. Here's why would you wouldn't. Do you think fired. a congressperson could get me fired? Do you think a senator who might let, get let involved? Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Dude, you, come you on. You know, I used to work at a, a different university, the University of Southern Maine, and their president fired 100 out of 400 tenured faculty members, yeah. some of them right near retirement. Yeah. Can that happen? Absolutely. If, of course, I mean, listen, if the president of the United States is silenced by Twitter, you could get fired. So, you know, if the president <laughs> could get fired, you can definitely get fired. But, you know, the left has a, a monopoly in education. You know, they 13 for one professors lean to the left and to the right. So th- there's a monopoly in the world you're in. All I'm saying from my end is think about it this way. Why do I have you on? This is a pro entrepreneurship, pro capitalism YouTube channel. Why do I have you on? Like, other channels wouldn't have you on. Why do I have you on? Do you know these are my favorite conversations? You, I think you like good conversations with people who are going to push back a little bit yes, because that's what absolutely. creates fire in terms of the discourse, right? But but you know what it is also for me is... The, <laughs> as long as respectful. No, the, the, for me, you know who wins in this conversation? Who do you think won today? The viewers win. That's right. The that's get it. To that's what, that's what mm-hmm. I want to do. The audience is going to go walk away and say, listen, I, I agree with what he said in this side. And I agree with you, Pat, 
what you said on the following side. So look, I, I, I've really enjoyed this. I can go a couple different things here, but I'll give you any, any final positions you want to take yourself. I mean, one of the things I wouldn't mind reading, because we haven't yet, we can wrap up with this a little bit of China. We got 14 more minutes and then we'll wrap up is Mao. Okay. You said a couple things about Mao. Okay. I'd like to yep. get your take on Mao. So you said uh, uh, you tweet a support for Chinese dictator Mao, uh, describing him as one of the greatest revolutionary re- leaders of all time. Why don't you unpack it? Because you have good things to say about him. You call this Tim uh, the greatest revolutionary leaders of all time, that meaning ahead of uh, Stalin. Tell me why him. Well, yeah, Mao is an incredibly important figure, uh, you know, in terms of China, but also in terms of the history of, of Marxism and communism. Um, you know, I mean, we what we have here, if we look at the long historical frame, right, we look at the last 150 years, okay, so since, you know, the development of kind of modern Marxism, the Communist Manifesto, et cetera, right? This is a, about, it's 170 years old or so, okay? Now, in the, at the time, there's no socialist countries at all, right? We, do, we look at 1848, Europe is emerging out of feudalism and is making a kind of the final transition away from the feudal aristocracy and toward, you know, liberal bourgeois kind of democracies and so forth, right? So, Socialism at the time is highly theoretical, you know, um, and, you know, that's why you have this relatively long document, right, the, the Communist Manifesto, and it has to say, like, here's what we mean by it, because the term is being used by lots and lots of people, right? Um, here's what we mean by it, okay? But when we get to, by the time we get to, like, 1949, the time of the, the Chinese Revolution, we're in a very different situation, right? Now we've we've had successful socialist revolutions. So Mao can study these, right? That the, the Chinese Communist Party can study this and say, what did we think has worked and what hasn't worked, right? Now, they are a little bit off the map in terms of, you know, Marx had predicted that the contradictions of capitalism would cause workers to get together and say, hey, we have some similar interests here, right? I mean, we're all working for a wage and our employers would like to pay us less. They'd like us to work harder. They'd like us to work longer so that they can have more profits. Our interest is overturning this system, right? Our interest is, look, the wealth that we produce should go to us. That's, you know, that that's the prediction. And so Marx has thought that the revolution would occur in the most developed capitalist countries. Now, what a surprise it was to find that wasn't true, right? They occurred in the least developed, like the the least. I mean, Russia is the least developed uh, capitalist country, capitalist slash feudal country uh, in in Europe. China has a very little capitalism in 1949, right? It has a little bit in the cities, but is again mostly an agrarian country. So Mao works with this, right? Mao works with the peasantry, lives with the peasants for 20 years, right, during a long march, um, and wins them over. I mean, that is remarkable, right? To see a leader that emerges from constant contact with the poorest people in the society, right? Now, these are people who are exhausted by warfare, right? Because they had the war, they had the warlord period, you know, they had internal fighting for decades and decades and decades. And so their peasants are familiar at the time with what do armies do when they come through. Here's what they do. They steal your food, they rape your daughter and they do whatever the hell they want, right? I mean, like, do they make your lives better in any way, <laughs> right? No, they don't, you know? The only thing that you can say that they do positively is they're fighting against another power that's trying to take you over, right? So, and this is the time when when Mao and the communists really start to become popular, right? They're fighting this war against this, you know, the, the Kuomintang, right? Um, uh, it's when the Japanese invade China, right? That the differences between these two different armies, right? So we have the, we have the KMT and we have the red army. Um, but Mao is insists on a different kind of conduct for his soldiers, right? He says, you have to pay for what you take, right? We have to treat people much differently, than any army has ever treated people because these are the people that we need to convince, right? We can't just take their stuff. And, you know, like we, we have to be different than that. And 
he does this, right? He gains massive widespread. The, the Red Army goes from having something like 40,000 troops to having a 4 million, right? And that shows its unbelievable popularity, right? Because so not only does he treat people ethically, right? And he's in a position of power. I mean, even if you have if you have 40,000, an army of 40,000, that's small relative to the KMT, but that's still a lot more power than any peasant has, right? So you can do whatever the fuck you want in that situation, right? But did Mao? No, right? Mao treated people very, very fairly because he saw it as like, these are the people that we're actually fighting for, you know? Um, now, does every leader do that? No, not at all, right? Most most guerrilla fighters are incredibly unethical, you know? Like, they mostly do whatever the hell they want, right? What? Now, then we could say, what did Mao do when he was in power, right? What Mao did when he, when he was in power is a very similar to Stalin, right? He said, we need to get the entire country organized the state is going to be the major employer, but we're going to do something that's never been done in China, which is we're going to make sure that everyone has the basics. Okay. In China, this is called the iron rice bowl, right? It's a bundle of guaranteed consumption goods. Okay. That never, ever existed anytime in Chinese history. Right. So the fair, and you know, this is among the first things that are done, right? Even while the economy is still emerging from the wreckage of, you know, m tens of millions of people died in the fighting and in the invasion of the Japanese and so on, right? Mao immediately turns toward improving the lives of the very poorest, right? These are things that I certainly admire, and I think anybody should admire, right? I mean, like, if you care about the fate of the poor, the fate of those who are the least advantaged in a society, well, this is a leader who put their needs very much you know, near the top, right? Now, I'm not going to say at the absolute top, right? Because every leader has the same challenge, which is how do you keep power in a world of hostile nations? They Do, do they want to eat your lunch? Do they want to depose you? Absolutely, they do. Do they have more power than you? Yeah, they do, right? We can see this, you know, the United States supported the KMT for decades after they fled to Taiwan. They said, well, that's the legitimate government of China, right? So, you know, we're not dealing with an equal kind of playing field here where the capitalist powers say, oh, yes, well, whoever ends up running the country is fine. No, not at all, right? We are dealing with a war, right? That war is the working class versus the bourgeoisie. So, you know, it's interesting. I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, this guy has never written a book. One, you should write a book because communists would love to uh, uh, I hear that from people, actually. But thank you for saying that. Very nice. Here's you. You sound okay. so devout to them, like you're such a true believer. At least when I spoke to Slavoj Žižek, he had some doubts, and he was questioning certain areas of communism that maybe didn't produce the results that he's more skeptical today than he was before. I talked to Richard Wolf. He's more a socialist. He's not a full blown communist at your level. He's a, a little bit different than you, although some similarities. You know, it, it, I just pulled up something right now. I, I typed the, the most evil dictators of all time. OK, number one is Mao, 49 to 78 million deaths. Number two is Stalin, 23 million deaths. That's what the site says. Now, give or take, you know, is what it is. I'm curious, just just purely out of curiosity. What do you think about Hitler? Well, Hitler is a fascist monster, you know, a, a, somebody who committed genocide, somebody who is uh, a would be imperialist. Yeah. Hitler did not focus his imperialism on Africa as the other capitalist powers did in the late 1800s. He focused his imperialism on Russia, right? I mean, the, the drive was to go east to give the German people living room, Lebensraum, right? I mean, that was, the, that was the German phrase. Now, they did that under the understanding that the Slavs and the Russian people were subhuman, you know? Now, they had a little bit of a problem ideologically because, you know, they had a white supremacist ideology. And they did recognize that the Slavs and the Russians were, or I don't, at least some of them were white, right? But they used this very old kind of mythological idea that said that the Slavs had black bones. And I mean, it was this just utter bullshit, right? So what you have here is you have fascist nationalism, which seeks to conquer territory based on racist ideology, right? Now, I think that that's pretty well established by history, right? The result of that is that tens of millions of people die, okay? That's unequivocal. Um, now, people like to draw equivalencies 
between anti-communists do between Hitler and Stalin. Uh, there are no equivalencies. Right? None of the things that I mentioned uh, apply in the slightest to uh, the Soviet Union, to any socialist country. They don't apply to China. Um, saying Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, and then saying something after that just advertises your ignorance, right? There's, there is no, there's no point in saying any, you know, anything further at this point. <laughs> you correct me. You correct me up. I do. Just now, in terms of Zizek, I, you know, doubt makes a good philosopher, yeah. you know, and, and Zizek's a great philosopher. So, you know, is it appropriate? Yes. Right. And Richard Wolff, you know, look, he's my mentor. I love him. You know, um, we have some maybe differences of opinion, but I think we just have a different style is more like it. You know, I think the differences of opinion are minor, actually. But we have, you know, we have different areas of emphasis, let's say. Right. Um, you know, I have a I have a style that's a lot more unequivocal. Right. Because I'm acting as more of a kind of ideological warrior, you know, than I am as a kind of sure. academic and, oh, let me weigh each side yeah. and da, 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 right? I do that in my written work. But, you know, I'm here as a popular figure, not as a, well, not as I a scholar. You, for yeah. what it's worth, for what it's worth, I thought you were going to be a lot more antagonistic than you were. I have to tell you that. I, I thought you were, you were going to be a lot more uh, uh, coming from a place of this thing was going to get zero to pissed off. I did an interview with, what's his name? Uh, what is his name? Lucian Truscott. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not. If you're not, if you want to entertain yourself, he is a great, 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 great grandson of Thomas Jefferson who wanted the statue to be removed. If you want to be entertained, just watch the first minute. You'll crack up. It's a 27 minute <laughs> interview. I'm going to do a quick speed round with you. I'll give you a name. Tell me one word that comes to mind and then we'll wrap it up. Any right. word that comes to mind, or you can say skip, uh, with any name. So Churchill, Uh, what's the word that comes to mind with Churchill? I mean, um, you know, I think of Churchill with the, the Bengal famine, really, you know, um, and if we want to look at a leader who intentionally starved people, I think that's, that's who we're looking for. We're not looking at Stalin or Mao. We're looking at Churchill. <laughs> Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. I like Bernie. Um, you know, he seems like a figure of of um, of integrity, um, although I think he's burning a lot of clout right now because, uh, you know, em embracing the Biden administration uh, and and going towards incrementalism, um, you know, started off saying Medicare for all and now is saying lower the eligibility age. You know, I, this is the kind of thing where what I had always said about Bernie is Bernie's the furthest right that I'm willing to go, you know. Wow. Okay. He's a, Fair. How about he's a, I consider him to be a right wing leftist um, because he's not saying, oh, you know, let's expropriate the rich. He's not saying that. Right. Yeah. He's not saying let's end capitalism. Yeah. He's saying, oh, we can tinker with it and make it work better. I don't believe in that. Would you say the furthest right wing or the furthest socialist? Uh, uh, you know what I mean? Like furthest socialist right wing. Bernie is a social Democrat, right? He's somebody who yeah. favors a reformed capitalism that has higher wages and more benefits or whatever, right? I, that, you know, I, I consider that to be a good result, but I think the only way you're going to get to that is through socialism, basically, you know, like I, I and that, that, that's what we've seen historically as well. How about AOC? AOC, I think, you know, it's a figure that a lot of us had high hopes for and, you know, it's exciting and whatever to see a socialist, but this is somebody who is, um, first of all, became way more famous than their, than their power, uh, you know, sort of, uh, merited, right? Like AOC as a freshman congressperson, basically no power, you know, um, your power as, as a congressperson depends on what coalitions can you build? What committees are you on and so forth, right? AOC had basically none of that, but she became, it was just catapulted to fame because she's young and oh, a socialist and whatever, you know, Fox news really made her famous. Um, and then becomes, oh, this is the lion of the left. Um, but, you know, leftists look at her and be like, what has she actually done? You know, um, what policies has she done that actually improve people's lives? And the record there is non-existent. So, you know, I, I like AOC, you know, she seemed like a good person, whatever, but, you know, uh, it's like, uh, you throw a handful of sand at an oncoming tidal wave. You're not really going to change the result okay. there. You know, Elizabeth Warren. 
Well, Elizabeth Warren, I put in a very different position. Elizabeth Warren is a very opportunistic uh, politician, in my view, somebody who, you know, Bernie's out there campaigning in 2016, talking about medical Medicare for all, uh, talking about the $15 minimum wage, uh, talking about everyone should have a job. What's Elizabeth Warren doing? Deafening silence, right? Um, then endorses Clinton, then comes and adopts that program without a word. Like, what the hell's that in the 2020 campaign? I mean, and and the entire Democratic field adopts all of Bernie's proposals. Why don't if you if you guys support the proposals, then you should be supporting Bernie, right? But none of these people did that. I just think it's opportunistic, okay. and, and you know, it's. A lot of my colleagues in academia, you know, love Elizabeth Warren. And so maybe I will end some friendships by, by speaking <laughs> ill of her. But at this point, I think probably nobody cares. Um, you know, I just think it's, it tells you whether you really support a program, though. You know, like, do you support it rain or shine <laughs> or just shine? You know, I don't think she's a true believer. I think, like you said, she's an opportunistic. That, that makes sense. How about yeah. uh, Fidel Castro? Well, Fidel Castro is an interesting one because Fidel Castro started off as a revolutionary, as a nationalist revolutionary, not as a socialist, interestingly enough, right? So Fidel embraces socialism later, right? Uh, he, he's just sort of, it's on the fence for a little while, right? It's kind of the U.S.'s response that pushes Fidel to, to socialism. But once he does that, he very much embraces it, right? So, you know, one of the first things that they did, I just wrote about this for uh, a, a new publication called The International. If people are interested, you can Google that. Um, I wrote about the economic achievements of, of Cuba. Uh, one of the first things that they do, they they uh, expropriate the land, right? So like I mentioned, in Cuba, similar to lots of places in Africa and so forth, you had most of the land being owned by a very small landowning class. Um, and, you know, uh, the Castro and the and the revolution, they said, look, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to we're going to turn the land over to the peasants. It then became state property. The state the state section uh, went to about 80 percent uh, of, of the land. They also had individual peasants also owning uh, their land individually. So they had a kind of mixed system. Um, but, in, you know, in general, I think I am I'm very favorably uh, inclined towards Castro and the revolution there also generated very good results. I got two other names for you. Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky. Um, yeah, big figure on the left. Not someone I've ever really been a fan of right. just because I don't see him as having a very good answer to, like, the question of what should be done, you know? Noam Chomsky is somebody who has good critiques, you know, like he critiques, the, his critiques of the media are very solid, right? Critiques of imperialism, good, right? He knows a lot about you, the history of U.S. imperialism, and that's that's very good. Uh, but does he have a very good vision of what should be done? You know, you said, hey, Noam Chomsky, you can write your ticket. What, what would it look like? I don't think so. You know, he doesn't have a, he just doesn't have, so that only takes you so far. As a critic, you need to have a positive vision of your own. Um, and so last but not least, our, our, our current president, your president, my president, Joe Biden. Well, Joe Biden is just the next iteration of, of Reagan. You know, I mean, like we've we've had a Reagan government <laughs> since Reagan. I mean, that's that's what we've had. You know, Clinton, the, the masterpiece of Clinton is that he rebranded the Democrats. You know, he said, we're Eisenhower Republicans now. I mean, this is literally what he said. Right. So, you know, Clinton and and the Democrats since Clinton have been very much in that vein. Um, the Republicans have gone in a very different direction, right? The Republicans have gone uh, toward a kind of, you know, nationalist and fascist kind of direction. Um, the, the Democrats are the ones now saying we are the technocrats and we are the ones that will, you know, tinker with the tech capitalism and make it work better and whatever. I personally don't believe in that. I think that's the that's the kind of Keynesian vision again. Right. Um, but they also do this with a very aggressive militarism. You know, the the U.S. military machine costs about one point two five trillion dollars a year. Once you add everything up, that's a stunning amount of wealth to spend on killing people. I got to tell you, I enjoyed having you on. Uh, appreciate you for answering questions and working uh, and going back and forth. This was a blast. Like I said earlier, I enjoy doing these things. Uh, we're going to put the link to both your YouTube channel. There's a video. I think there's 10 criticism you give of capitalism. Some, I think, I don't know what the title is. 
We'll put the link to your YouTube channel below if somebody wants to watch it. We're going to put the link to your Twitter as well below if anybody wants to go send a tweet at him. And I, I would love to hear what you took away from today's interview. Having said that, Doc, appreciate your time. It's been good having you on. Thank you so much. And you know, I'd love to come back. So if you want to have me back on the show, let's have dinner sometime. I am paying. No, you're not. (laughs) (laughs) I will take you up on that off and I definitely look forward to it. Appreciate you. We'll definitely have you back on. All right. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. So when's the last time you saw a communist and a capitalist sit down together, have a good conversation at the end? One of them says, hey, I'd love to take you out to dinner, especially the communists. We made history today. Anyways, it was a great conversation. Curious what you took away about what he had to say. He made a lot of strange comments. Again, if you're watching this, uh, Doc, a lot of strange comments were made. What'd you take away from it? Comment below. If you enjoyed it, put a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. I got two other videos I want you to watch. One of them is with me and Richard Wolf. If you've never watched it, he's a number one socialist professor in America, according to Forbes. Click over here to watch it. And the other one is an interview I told you know, a, a, a satar about is Lucian Truscott. Well, within a minute, he got pretty upset. If you haven't seen this one, you want to be entertained. Go watch my interview here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.